Before the scourge of 2020-21, crowds of maskless people used to attend events up and down the country. One such was the annual attack on Prudhoe Castle in Northumberland, and I was there. The war depicted was that of the Roses, twixt the houses of York and Lancaster, but of course, you know that they weren't called the Wars of the Roses at the time, don't you? As civil wars go, this one was reasonably civil, in that it was mainly soldier against soldier. From 1455 to 1485, the two rival branches of the Plantagenet family fought over which would rule. The answer was neither of them, because they killed off all of each other's claimants to the throne. And the medieval period ended, there and then. They ruled a line, and then the Tudors took over and started their own period. This particular reenactment of the conflict was staged for the benefit of an audience, with a castle for a backdrop. This meant bending history a bit, as the castle actually changed hands bloodlessly. The Battle of Hexham, ten miles away, took place on May the 15th, 1464, and Sir John Neville, then Lord Montague and Warden of the East March, decisively defeated the Lancastrians in the north. This display imagines that remnants of the defeated army have made it to Prudhoe Castle and are holding out defiantly under the command of William Burr, brother of the late Earl of Northumberland. There was drama! You will all die! That is it! No negotiation! Gentlemen, carry your arms! Fighting! Bangs! Music! More bangs! An escalade! Injury! twanging, and lots of falling over. There was also some rather good kit. Whom do we have here, sir? You look very noble. <laughs> I'm Lord Montague. Mm -hmm. um, I've just won the Battle of Hexham. Oh, well done. Just marvel at his banner, an early Yorkish banner showing the Rose en Soleil, or en Soleil, or Rose in the Sun. Superb workmanship. This indicates because of the quartering and all the others, is all the estates and other major households that the Nevilles actually own or recognise for what they are. So you see their own individual one is the saltier, the white saltier cross on the red. But every one of the other little parts of the badges indicates estates, areas, nobility, noble households that they actually know in control of. And if you look at Richard Nevilles, it's about three times as much complicated as this. Now, a lot of people, I think, associate the kettle hat with a lowly foot soldier, uh, but, uh, but here you are, a, a, a near royalty, and you're wearing this rather magnificent thing. Could you tell us a bit about this, your kettle hat? Uh, this kettle hat is a reproduction, where it's a copy of one that's on the, what's called the Beauchamp Chronicles, which is based on the arrival of Edward IV when he came back into the country, and is one, worn by one of his retainers. Now remember, as a king, his retainers are not going to be ordinary soldiers. They are nobles themselves. So the difference you can tell on this is, the bit is, when you're wearing your armour, one reason why you have the liveries on, and the helmets as they are, is so that you can ident be identified on the field. Now, it's a bit like gunslingers. Which ones are really dangerous? So you find out, I'm not going near him, I recognise that livery, he's a killer. Or, I'm going to take him down, he's worth money. The biggest problem you get on the field is actually being able to tell friend from foe, which happened in Barnet because of the difficulties in the weather. All of this is symbolism, but also points out who I am. So what you have is the gold, again, similar to this, the gold uh, uh, sun in splendour mm -hmm. on the top of the helmet. So you've got gold on a case-hardened helmet. So that's actual gold on that reproduction? Yes as they would be worn. Everything, the aim is for everybody you see doing this, we get as close as we can to the reality of the time. They're easy to wear, it gives you more vision to be able to see things, and better at shouting. All right. Otherwise I'd be wearing the common helmet, or more common helmet called a sally, which actually protects me against the archers. Uh, I was just talking to a handgunner, and he said that he used to wear a kettle hound, uh, but it caught the sound of his gun so painfully that he swapped to a salad. And actually, these are quite, even though the weight on them, they're quite effective in the sunshine as well. I do get a bit of shade. So this is not a voider, unless you have some very strange plate armour. <laughs> this is the equivalent of a jack chain, but done with mail. Yes. Right, so um, does that come from a, a painting or something like that? There are, pain there are paintings of, 
all different formats, whether in chain, links, you can see them in larger links as well, connected to steel plates, bars connected to it, or the standard shell guards and long lengths you see. It depends on what you can do and what you can afford. This is quite effective against cuts. It is not effective at all against this. There isn't going to make any difference. <coughs> if he puts his arm in the way, he loses an arm. You would lose an arm. So, the handy safety tip for you there. The French one normally uses a hammerhead, and it's normally a four-point hammerhead within that, which comes to their own individual spikes. And then the, the other side of it has the crow's beak or the curved beak coming through. They are not normally very sharp. They don't need to be. It's an armour piercer, but all the weight comes onto the punch for that and it will peel armour apart. I have tried it experimentally, it works. They still have the spikes both end. Good ones, these, undo that and the whole head comes apart. And the English equivalent instead has? The English equivalent has the axe blade to the front and instead of the hammer, you have the beak at the back. And that's more English. A brigandine cuirass with view to the interior. And no, it is not studded leather. This is substantial plate armour, often worn by nobility and commoners alike. Now we have here a guy wearing some magnificent blued armour. Can you tell us about this, sir? Well, blueing is a technique that was uh, very popular in the period, um, primarily because it, uh, it stopped your armour from rusting, so it meant you could actually keep it clean. Uh, you might tell by the accent, I'm Scottish, so it was, it was particularly popular in Scotland at the time, uh, the blueing of armour, and it was primarily because of the weather. A uh, special technique that they used with oil uh, and heat treatment to put the oil through the armour and uh, give it that blue effect and stop it from rusting as easily as some of the shiny silver people you see walking about have to take great care of their armour because uh, it rusts very very easily. But is there not great heartache when you see all these tiny scratches in your beautiful blue surface? No that means it's doing its job. So, uh, yes, if, if, if it's scratched the armour, then it's not scratching me, so the armour is doing its job. Uh, I wear my armour for uh, a practical purpose and not to look good like the commanders. Is it a Mesa or is it a Falchion? Well, it's got a, a, a pinned on pommel, but it's got a nagel there, and it's got the little scallopy bit out the back of the tip. So it's one or the other. A little bit more. I suppose it's just up, up to you to decide. Yeah. <laughs> I, I change my mind depending on who I'm talking to. All right. Okay. And, and, and talking to me, it's a. It's a falchion. Oh, it's a falchion. Okay. Because this is a battle. Yes. And I'm English. Talking of battle, many methods of assault were tried throughout the day. This being England, they had to try archery. This low poundage attack had little effect on a fortified target and made the defenders duck only for a short while. It wasn't coordinated with another type of assault. Next, they tried an escalade with just the one ladder and getting it up the steep slope was not achieved rapidly and the archers had mysteriously stopped shooting but some handgunners tried to give support but not one of them hit a thing. It was almost as though they'd forgotten to put the lead balls in. Egged on by his fellows, the man at the top of the ladder was able to reveal that the palisade was made of substandard materials. In a display of reckless bravery, he went in on his own. Yep, dead. Comedy moment. The women rush out from the camp to see off the enemy with mallets and frying pans. There is almost a rout, but the men are steadied in time. Ladles and gentlemen, oils and pearls, welcome to the wonderful world of Wondrium, Hooray! our kind sponsor. Yes, Wondrium, described by many as a museum for your Ooh. mind. D don't worry, madam. 
Dubois. It's not as bad as it sounds. They won't <laughs> remove your brain from its uh, usual place and place it in a glass cabinet for passers-by to gawp at. No, they wouldn't do that. They're kind people. They are good people at Wondrium. Wondrium is an enormous website, and on this website you will find thousands, yes, thousands of lectures on all sorts of topics by great renowned scholars from all around the world. Though principally the USA. <laughs> Um, now, how can you be sure that these, that these scholars are of the highest caliber? Well, ladies and gentlemen, do we have any medievalists in the room? <laughs> As I suspected. Well, ladies and gentlemen. You might be interested to know, for instance, that there is a course on the High Medieval Period. Oh, yes. Hey. Not the Low Medieval Period. Oh, no, the High Medieval Period. And, uh, well, just look at the scholarship of its lecturer. Look, look at the quality of that finger prison, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, the gestures. Ah, that's clearly a man who knows his stuff. Well, if you want to see this lecture and loads more like it, just in that very course, for instance, there are many things that you medievalists just adore. There are people travelling halfway across the world to kill other people for no particularly good reason in the Crusades. Hey! Hey! Yeah, and there are plagues. Oh, yeah. Woo! Which is, yeah, <laughs> and, and the Inquisition and torture. Hey! Hey! And, and of course, the joy, the, ah, uh, the just unmitigated joy, ladies and gentlemen, of feudalism. <laughs> well, well, mind you, ooh. And you can try all of this. Yes, you can. All you have to do is click the link in the, link in the description. That's all you have to do. It's so simple. But if you really must, you could type um, uh, wandrium.com stroke Lindy Beige, and there you will be taken whoosh, to details of a fantastic trial period. And you can wander around this amazing site and see loads of lectures. And oh, it'll just be wonderful. So there you go, ladies and gentlemen, the wonderful world of Wondrium. Um, that's enough of that. So we've got the, the, the best goo, or best goo, and this one has a single point suspension in the middle, and it's not attached to the pauldron, but in fact is attached to the doublet very high up on the shoulder, and it's got a huge, huge amount of movement in it. So as you move your arm around, it hangs in the gap. Do you never find uh, that it gets gets caught and gets stuck? Sometimes it does, but it's, it's just a case of flipping it out so it you know, tastes different. But yeah, this one has slipped down a bit because I've been wearing it all day. The thing about armour is you can put it on and then 20 minutes later you need to adjust it. So you'll never get a perfect fit first time. You will need to adjust and adjust and adjust uh -huh. before you're ready. That's why it takes so long to get dressed. You can put a harness on in about 20 minutes, but you won't... With help, but you won't want to wear it. To wear it one that's been put in for 20 minutes all day. It'd just be uncomfortable. Okay, so you would rather spend what half an hour? Half an hour, an hour. Put it on, make an any hour. adjustments. Yeah, you can take up to an hour. Right. So let's hope you're not ambushed. <laughs> to be honest, I think if you were ambushed, you you wouldn't you wouldn't be bothered trying to put it on. You'd be trying to get away off it. And he has got spaulders, not pauldrons, so they're a lot smaller, so there's less chance that the best view will get caught underneath the spaulder. <laughs> we have here an English armour with lots and lots of tassets. How many tassets do you have, sir? Seven, sir. And is that enough? That is enough to tap this more. Oh, no. Got one big one at the back. Tap from the bum? Yeah. Not so handy if you're riding a horse? Cannot ride a horse in this at all. This is pure English foot armour. So how did you get here? You have to take this off, mm -hmm. take this section off, then I can ride a horse. This whole section drops off at the front and the back. So you would ride with a different uh, um, set of kit on? You usually ride to the battle, yeah. dismount, because a horse is a, a nightmare in a fight. Mm -hmm. Because if it gets hit, you're going down with it, right. which it more likely will do with lots of arrows. Is that right, sir? Yes. They're just a big target. Then I drop down onto foot and fight like this. Right. Usually with a pole weapon rather than... This is more of a show weapon or a... Right. One and a half. It's pretty useless on a battlefield, to be honest. So how long does it take you to get from a riding configuration to foot configuration? Seconds. Oh, seconds? Literally, all you have to do is one clip here, yeah. there's one at the back, right. and then a tacit at the side. 
that needs doing up so I can get it. Someone can put that on me in seconds. Can you do it yourself? No. Ah, okay, it's impossible. So seconds with the help of your squire. With the help of the squire. Uh -huh. I can do this one up. I can't do that one up. I can't do the side strap up here. And also, there's a tacit at the side here that locks, locks me in. See that one there? Oh, yeah. That holds it together as well. I can't do them on my own. I can't put my arms on. All I can do is put my gauntlets and legs on and helmet. That's it. Nothing else. I can't put my bever on. So you're quite limited. You need some help. I see that you've got a pair of riding boots. Uh, so you're, you're quite happy to, to fight on foot with unarmored feet. Yes. This is for speed. <laughs> Hello. What's this, eh? Shiny man. This is like a man at arms rather than a knight sort of attire. You might just wear a brigandine um, even as a, a knight or men at arms and then put your full armour on when you actually um, dis you know, um, you reached your, your destination and, and dismounted um, to fight on, on foot. Um, well, the brigandine has the advantage that you can do it up yourself. So we have on your armour two besagues, I see, which are suspended uh, from the... Now then. Is it a spalder or is it a pauldron? I would it's say it's a demi pauldron. pauldron it's a called. demi pauldron. A demi pauldron. Okay, because it's just not quite all the way to the full pauldron. That's it. So right. it's part time. A full one would reach part way down my back. Right. Yes. And uh, a spalder is just a short version. Mm -hmm. And these are designed. Yep. So when I lift my arm, it drops in the gap. And do you ever find that uh, it gets caught in your breastplate and? Uh... Yeah, sometimes. But just a quick. But sometimes, when you're fighting, your pauldron can get stuck in your breastplate. Are we mobilising? That has happened to me. No, yes, that's, that's what happens. Well, where were you? You are scum. Where were you? Just do what you told me, I was you expecting lot. a glorious leader, and where were you? Uh, back here, where defending the castle while you lot were just messing around. Willy nilly, sitting down, drinking. I see here you've gone for the, the salad and bevel combination. And uh, what do you think are the advantages of this over, uh, say, the closed helmet? Salet's bevers eminently wearable. That they are a functional helmet that you can wear all day. You can take the helmet off, keep the bever on. You can take the bever off, keep the helmet on. The bever closes or drops. You can eat, drink, hear, do things other than fight in it. It's not as protective as a closed helm. There are gaps and weak points in it, but I would rather have a helmet that I'm going to be wearing at the time than a really good helmet that I've left at home in the locker room. I like salaries and bevers, they work. They're comfortable. You seem happy enough, sir. Are you all right? Got plenty of wine in me, plenty of opiates. Happy days. Yeah, it's but a scratch. Upward versus downward shot dilemma. What's going on here? So I think the upward shot deflect off there over the top of my helmet yes. mm -hmm. which I think is a good thing I'm much more likely to have somebody stabbing me in the face with a pole axe point or bill or whatever yeah. downwards yes yeah, something could hit my helmet glance onto there maybe penetrate into my visor but it's coming in at hopefully an angle that Five won't minutes, be too gentlemen. much it's a compromise. It's got to deflect somewhere and I'd rather stop an upward shot than the miraculous downward dropping arrow. The next move was to deploy grappling hooks. In reality, these could perhaps be used for pulling down a palisade, but here the ropes were used mainly to help people get up the steep slope. A sally from the castle saw off the first of the grapple hook teams, but very politely they left the ropes in place. If you have ever tried to move up a steep slope in armour and authentic leather-soled boots, you will appreciate that this slope is a major challenge. With a rope to help them ascend, men came forward with grenades. Still, the defenders held out. There was next an unconvincing attempt to undermine the walls with picks and shovels, which was seen off by some women who dropped slightly less unconvincing solid granite blocks onto the attackers.
a replica, a modern replica of a late 14th century, early 15th century hackbutt, um, sometimes known as an arquebus. It's basically um, a matchlock, muzzle-loading, um, smooth-bore musket. The charge goes down the barrel, followed by wadding and a small lead ball or canvas bag of shot. Then it's rammed down with a scouring stick. The word ramrod would come later. Then you'd prime the pan with gunpowder and keep it covered until needed. Then you could open the pan, squeeze the tiller bar, and then the cord, soaked in saltpetre to keep it burning steadily, would set it off. The flash in the pan would ignite the main charge through the little touch hole in the breech and bang! Aim it roughly at a group of foes 50 yards away and you'll probably hit someone. The blunt ball would shatter bones and carry into the flesh bits of clothing that would cause infections. Nasty. Then nip back behind a block of billmen to reload. Under ideal conditions, an arquebusier could fire three shots in a minute, but battlefield conditions made it as bad as one shot every five minutes. You can fire this from the shoulder, but to be honest, it is usually fired underneath the armpit or from the hip. Here we have a contradiction, because we are told jack chains are the poor man's armour, but here we have beautiful, bright, fluted jack chains. So what's, what's going on? Well, simply that, it's very useful as a lighter combatant, say an archer, someone who has to use their arms a lot for the combat. Right. Uh, or within the battle itself to have lighter armour on their arms so the archers well paid they're getting sometimes paid twice as much as the average billmen or man at arms so it is a useful item for them to own okay yeah. so Be i'm only an archer yeah. but i'm a richer archer than that other archer next to me indeed yeah or you've pillaged more basically if you've been on the winning side <laughs> here we have a very pretty yew bow and it has a side knock here at the end. So uh, what, what's happening there then? It's side knocked. Um, we don't know why, to be honest. It doesn't make the slightest bit of difference to the bow and its use. Mm -hmm. um, but of course, when they discovered the Mary Rose, that's when they discovered that they were still using side knocks at that period. Right, so that's just, if we just turn it around slowly, so you can see that it's only on one side. And uh, this is the... This is face knocked, which is the alternative. Which we know from the Victorian periods onwards that they were definitely using. Right, and so that has a side knock on one side at one end and... Uh, and the opposite side the other end. Hmm. Okay, so it, it, it's a mystery. It is a mystery, yes, I'm afraid. Look at this amazing pervice! Surely it would give perfect protection to the man behind it, simply because no crossbowman could bring himself to mar such a work of art. Then it was the turn of the gunners to batter down the defences. Let's see how long it takes them to get off another shot. A fairly leisurely pace of reloading, I'd say. One minute, 45. One shot a minute can be done with a well-drilled crew and a bit of motivation. Anyway, here's the thing. A copper pricker there in the touch hole. Copper doesn't create sparks, unlike iron. An inch and a half calibre bore. It's a bit puny for a siege. It's, it's mostly a field artillery piece. So it'd be designed for shooting a small ball that would skip up the battlefield and take people's legs out. That's the main purpose of it. And then when they get a bit closer, you start using clod shot, which is an erratic ball. It sort of jumps from side to side because it's just a piece of bar, really. And then when they get closer again, you would use, um, probably in this period, flint, mostly. Um, maybe a small basket or bag shot, which may be musket balls or something similar put into a small cloth bag to make them stick together for longer as they go up the field. Thank you. Nasty. So a single lump for longer range and lots of little things for shorter range. Yeah, you turn, turn it into a giant shotgun when you get up close and then you hit more targets. Then. So how close is close? I imagine pretty close. Yeah. Yeah, if you're talking less than 50 yards, then you'd start using 
some sort of basket or grape, what would later be called grape shot. The hinge that elevates. Here you see how the elevation control worked. Simple enough. One little detail here is a hand gunner's pricker, which is made out of some brass, uh, sorry, some copper alloy to prevent sparks. So because the wheel size is quite large, it's quite manoeuvrable. To load it, first swab with a wet mop to extinguish any embers, then dry with a dry mop, then just a spoonful of powder, turn it over to drop the powder, then in with the wadding and ram that home, then the ball and ram that home hard with a mallet. Prick the touch hole and prime it with powder and put a lead cover over to prevent accidents. When you're ready, apply a match and bang! Effective range about 200 yards with solid shot. When you're sieging a castle, you don't want wheels on a cannon. For consistency, you want something that's dug in so that it doesn't move on its recoil. So you can consistently hit the same place on a wall over and over again and do damage to the castle. Problem with wheels, the cannon will roll backwards and you'll have to reset your aiming position. So another detail of the kit here is little, little black marks here. You can see them perhaps more clearly against the orange. And uh, on this gentleman here, you can see them up his sleeves and uh, there's quite a big one there in his tunic. And uh, what caused those? Uh, that, they're rocks of powder. So occasionally when you get large lumps, they blow back in the wind or from the touch hole. So around the touch hole, you can see the powder scoring. Mm -hmm. The small amount of powder that you poured on the top for a primer is thrown out by the touch hole. So that goes up like a Roman candle, like a fountain. So the pressure inside the barrel throws that into the air and then it decorates us. So one way you would be able to know a gunner in this period is it had loads and loads of little burn marks in his tunic. And occasionally you'd have um, little tattoos in your face. So you may oh, have right. blue marks embedded in your skin where you had particularly large pieces of powder. Like, that a, maybe, like a coal miner's scar. Yeah, where it would burn, burn into your skin. These tools of the gunners, fleeces, rammers, worms and the like, would all be familiar to gunners from four centuries later. But then there was a last minute and utterly futile sally out by the defending forces and soon their commanders were prisoners. You are dead men! Get me a rope! Get me two ropes! Once again! Let me fire a sword in my Shut up! Once again! I suggest you read that. Coming out. My brother never wrote that. that Your, is brother. Never Your brother wrote that. That is his signature. I have safe conduct to Scotland. I am leaving. Get out of my sight. I am leaving. Get out of my sight now. You, sir, are a dead man. You, sir, don't have a pardon. You, sir, are fought against the crown. And you have betrayed me. Shut up! I will oh. see you dead! Oh. You are gonna hang! Give me a sword, let me shut shut it up. man's way! You're gonna die like a felon! Find a big tree, because he weighs a lot. Kill him! I must congratulate the Beaufort Company, the reenactment group behind this great show, and thank their members for all the interviews. Three cheers, hip hip! Hip hip! Hip hip!